Anybody else? One of your top three or five Christmas movies, Christmas Vacation? Anybody? Yes, yes. Okay, that's good. I am amongst friends then, family, right? Um, I actually was not allowed to watch Christmas Vacation, but then I'm when I was growing up. And uh, so I did not experience Christmas Vacation until I got married to Troy, um, who has then corrupted me and uh, showed me all of these uh, crazy Christmas movies. Um, but I will tell you, if you've not seen it, um, you know, be good to, to check into that before you watch it, all right? Um, but man, I am loving, I love Christmas season. I, I do, my birthday's in the month of December, and I just love Christmas lights. I love all the sights and the sounds. Um, I love the plaid. I just love it all, all right? And uh, But I've been loving the series that we've been in, and I know for me personally, uh, Jesus has been using it to grow my faith. And I just love that, man, I've known Jesus for a long time now, and I'm so grateful. <laughs> but I'm so grateful that he has even more for me to learn, and even more for me to understand, and even more for each and every one of us to be able to see the true reason for the season in Christmas. That it doesn't matter how long you've known the story or maybe how long you've been uh, around the story. Sometimes in America, we can grow up and we can hear this story and it's just a story. But then we can take a step to actually experience the story. We get to experience Jesus, and it really makes Christmas come alive in a whole new way. But I've loved this series because week one, we talked about Christmas trees. I love Christmas trees. It is like one of my goals, hopefully, to see the huge tree in Rockefeller Center um, someday in New York City. Uh, not right now. Uh, but the bummer is it's cold and, and it's winter in New York City every year. And so I don't know if we'll ever go because Troy does not like cold. Um, so I just got to go by myself. And uh, there's my next year's birthday gift. Send me to New York by myself and uh, write that down. So, um, but I, I love Christmas trees. Um, I love our tree. Um, but it was so cool in that first week of this series, Home for the Holidays, of asking Jesus, Jesus, in the midst of this season, how do I see you more clearly? How do I see you better? And that when we see the tree, Jesus would say, remember me. When you see the tree, remember me. Remember that my tree was brutal. The cross was brutal. But because of that brutal tree that Jesus died on and then rose from the dead three days later, that means we can have so much more than just beautiful trees. We can have full, abundant life in Jesus. Last week, we talked about the candy cane, and we passed out candy canes, and everybody was sticky. It was awesome. You're welcome, parents. And, uh, and But the candy cane reminds us that God is our good shepherd, right? And that he leads us, and he guides us, and, and he feeds us, and sometimes he gently nudges us. He's a good shepherd. And today, if you haven't figured it out already, <laughs> we're talking about Christmas lights. How many of you, it's a tradition in your family or a tradition on your own to go look at Christmas lights? Anybody? Okay, good, good. That has been a tradition since I was a little kid. It's one of the, the things I remember most. I remember one year, um, I don't remember how old I was, but my mom had organized. Dad, if you're watching this, we know it was all mom. You were just along for the ride. And, uh, and mom <laughs> uh, rented a, a, a limo for us. And all of our family, we got to go look, ride in a limo and look at Christmas lights. One of my, just a fun, Christmas memory, um, but it is still a favorite thing for our family to do now with our little girls, and uh, it's actually, it's I'm, I'm always like nostalgic too, um, because around this time of year was when Troy and I had our first date, and I don't have a picture because, you know, we didn't have picture like cameras on our phone back then and uh, <laughs> um, but we looked a lot younger than we do now and uh, and so or at least one of us does and so so with but one of our first dates or our very first date was to go look at the Christmas lights at Silver Dollar City and so you have some pictures that'll come up we just took our girls back a few weeks ago when they were off school and there's like six million twinkle lights and uh, the lights were twinkling Clark it was just beautiful it was so fun 
And then this is wild. <laughs> so last Sunday, there's actually a family in our church, the Wanklands, and this is a tradition that they do every year. They rent a big like party bus, and she even had her great granddad in the bus, and they all go look at Christmas lights. And I don't want to brag or anything, but they actually knocked on our door and gave us an award for our Christmas lights. And, um, and really, we cheated somehow because there's no way we're the most elegant. But uh, she, she was just being sweet. That was her Christmas gift to us. But that was just fun. I love seeing families having those types of moments or friends having those moments together. And then last week, man, last week was a big week for me personally. Um, last week, I turned 35. I'm officially in my mid-30s. Uh, my sister in law is still so angry because I'm not 40 yet. And, uh, and literally that happened in a group text. I can't believe you're not 40 yet. And, uh, but so last week I entered my mid thirties. I was able to graduate with my master's degree. So what do you do? Thank you. You guys are very kind. Um, <laughs> and, uh, think, what do you do when it's your birthday, you turn 35, you graduate with your master's and your university is an hour away from Orlando. You go to Disney World. <laughs> and, uh, and literally, that's what we did. And so, no joke, check out the castle. It was the 50th anniversary um, of Walt Disney World. And they did a 15-minute light show on that castle with like timed music, you know, the wish upon a star song where like this, there was literally a firework that was like a shape of a star somehow that went over timed, went over the castle, like right at the exact same time. It was, it was nuts. But can I tell you that the best money can buy, right? Is Walt Disney World. Like everything's excellent. Everything's incredible. It was 15 minutes of like laughter and that's amazing. It was so fun. And then it was over. <laughs> and I've got pictures and I've got memories and I'm thankful for that. But what Jesus wants to remind us of this season of when we see Christmas lights is that he is the light of the world. And that Jesus doesn't have one finale that we think, man, that was awesome, and then it's over. G Jesus doesn't run out of light. Jesus doesn't run out because, oh, we forgot to plug that in, right? Or anybody lose power this week? <laughs> yes, yes, we were out for a couple days and uh, first world problems, right? But, but, man, it's amazing when we're disconnected from the light what that does to us. So today we're going to talk about how Jesus being the light of the world impacts our life. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about light, so let's go to God's word. Genesis chapter 1, in the very beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. Imagine that. But the spirit of God was hovering over the waters and God said, let there be light. And there was light. First John three, five. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you. God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. What a promise, my friends. God doesn't have a bad day. It's not like one day he gets a little bit dimmer. No, he's always light. He's always bright. There is no darkness. Ephesians 1.18. This has been the prayer I've been praying over each of us, whether we're here in room 9 or room 10 or online. This is a prayer I'm praying for you today. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light. Be flooded with Jesus so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called. John 1, 6, God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe. Why? Because of his testimony, because of his story. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. And we all have an opportunity today to determine who is Jesus. Is he really the light of the world? Ephesians 5.8 says, for once you were full of darkness, each of us. When we are disconnected, when we're unconnected, when we do not believe Jesus is who he said, he said he was and follow Jesus, we have darkness. But now, connected to Jesus, we have light from the Lord. So what do we do? 
we live as people of light. So we're going to look at three insights today that are going to help us understand how Jesus being the light of the world impacts our life. And hopefully as you look at Christmas lights over this next week and a half, um, that you'll be reminded that Jesus is the light of the world. But then at the very end, we're going to have just a few practical next steps of how we, if we're followers of Jesus, can live as people of the light. So if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Number one, light invades darkness. John 8, 12, Jesus spoke to the people once more and he said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life, the light that leads to life. His light invades our darkness. Have you ever gotten up in the middle of the night, maybe to use the restroom, <laughs> and you don't turn the lights on because you're like, I got this. I know exactly where the, the end of the bed ends, right? Like, I know exactly where I put that 17th Amazon box that I've not wrapped yet. I, I know exactly where I put all that. And then you get up, and then you kind of stumble around. You fall. You end up waking up everybody, it, even in the midst of you trying to be sneaky or stealthy. Or you go into the bathroom, and uh, you don't realize that somebody left the toilet seat up. And you sit down, and you get a little, uh, a little refreshment um, in the middle of the night, right? Like, there is something... <laughs> about the dark and Jesus wants to invade our darkness because here's the truth today we each have a, a dark room today some of us are feeling the darkness a little more than others some of us maybe feel like we're in a dark room of hurt of betrayal a dark room of unforgiveness a dark room of just being exhausted, of not feeling like you got your feet, you know, under you. Maybe you're in a dark room and you're just feeling greedy. You're feeling a lack of compassion. You're, you're, you're not really walking with mercy. You're just in a dark room. And Jesus wants you to know there is no room he cannot light up. <laughs> there is no room that will stay dark forever if we just invite him in to invade our darkness again check this out jesus spoke to the people i am the light of the world christmas as much as i love the lights and the trees and the peanut clusters and anybody else do like the chocolate covered um ritz crackers with peanut butter in the middle Oh, come on, somebody. I mean, it is delicious. And some of you, now I've distracted you because now you're ordering on Dylan's or Walmart or wherever you go, and you're like, I'm going to get that almond bark, and I'm making those today. And uh, But, man, as much as I love caramel brulee lattes from Starbucks, yes, yeah, and, uh, man, it is not good, those holiday cups. It just makes the coffee taste even sweeter. And so, but as much as I love all that, Jesus would say, I am the reason we celebrate. I am the reason. I am the light of the world. And Jesus would say, you know what? You know what's awesome? Is that I'm not just the light of the world for followers of Jesus. I'm not just the light of the world for people who act a certain way or behave a certain way. No, I am the light of the world means that I am the light for the broken. I am the light for the hurting. I am the light for the grieving. I am the light for those who feel like they don't belong. I am the light for those who have had every success, but yet have an inner emptiness that life has not been able to quench. And Jesus is said, says, I am the light of your world. I am the light of your dark room, If you, but let me in. Now, John 8, 12 is our theme verse today. There's so much to unpack, but we really can't understand the depth or the richness of verse 12, that he is the light of the world, and whoever walks with him doesn't have to walk in darkness. We can't understand the depth of that truth without reading the verses that come before. So if you have your Bible or you're taking notes or you can look on the screen, John chapter 8, verse 2. So here's what happens before Jesus says, that he's the light of the world. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts. 
let's just pause there. Jesus in the morning, just like what we're doing, he gathered together. Again, it, it was a common practice. That's why it's so important as often as we can to gather together because there is power in coming together. So Jesus is in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group. And they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing Jesus, can we just pause a moment and imagine the shame? Imagine the shock. Imagine that you're sitting around and you're hearing from this teacher who you've ha has just a glow about him, that there is, he is fully truth, he's fully grace. I mean, he's meek, he's kind, he's joyful, he's loving, he's challenging. It's, it's this amazing teaching. And then all of a sudden, a woman who was caught in the act of adultery, which means that they already knew that she was having an affair and were watching, trying to catch her in the very act so likely she's scantily clad and she's thrown into the middle of a church service and everyone's sitting down but she's standing up and she's being accused and we know it takes two to tango but she is on her own full of shame what's thinking I'm about to die I'm about to die so Jesus what does Jesus do Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. If I were that girl, I'd be like, for one, I would take a pause, I guess, on I'm about to die and be like, why are you writing in the dirt, dude? <laughs> like, this seems to be kind of a serious situation. But Jesus paused. He paused in the moment. He writes down. And as he is writing something on the ground check this out when they kept on questioning him so here he is writing something on the ground and they continue to question continue to throw shame on this gal continue to try to put jesus into a corner when they kept on questioning him he straightened up so he stood up and he said to them let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And then again, he dropped down and he started writing in the sand. I think it was in that moment when that gal who had made poor choices, who had stiff-armed God and was doing her own thing and was at the feet of Jesus, I think in that silence for a second, a few seconds as Jesus is near her, but she's wondering what's going to happen. Maybe her eyes are closed. At this point, I imagine she's curled up in, in the fetal position trying to, to, to maybe be prepared for a stone, a huge rock that is about to hit her. But instead of being hit by a rock, all of a sudden she begins to hear rocks dropping, thudding, one by one. The rocks don't hit her, they hit the ground. Now, for a couple thousand years, <laughs> theologians and historians have tried to figure out what was Jesus riding in the sand. And they have not figured it out because Jesus didn't tell us what he was riding. It's not really important. You know, maybe, maybe Jesus was riding anger. Maybe he was riding unforgiveness in the sand. Maybe he was riding greed. Maybe he was writing, you know, a lack of compassion. Maybe he was writing religiosity. And maybe as he said, if you are without sin, throw the first stone. Maybe it was, okay, yeah, I, I have sin too. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first. Can I just encourage you? Older doesn't just mean age. <laughs> if you've been following Jesus for a season, can you be a leader? Can you lead with compassion? 
can you lead with saying you're sorry first? Can you lead with being, with, with being forgiving? Can you lead and say, hey, you know what? Yes, my brother or sister has fallen, but man, I'm going to lead with truth and with grace. The older ones went first. They led the way for the next generation until only Jesus was left. The only one who could condemn her, the only one who could have had a stone, didn't ever have a stone. And then check this out. With the woman still standing there, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Some of us today need to be reminded that Jesus does not call us out to condemn us, but he calls us out to restore us. That Jesus did not come at Christmas to condemn us, to stomp on us, to tell us what horrible people we are. I mean, sometimes that's the picture we have of God. That he is just mean, he's ready to slap us, he's angry. No, no, no. John tells us in chapter 3, verse 17, For God did not send his son, his only son, into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus has come to invade our darkness. Now, I know some of you, even in this moment, you're like, I don't even like church. I, I didn't think I was going to even like this place. Church at the movies. Why did I even come? Like, right? Like, you maybe came in today or you're watching online and you're like, man, I don't even, I, I think Jesus was a liar. I think he was a lunatic. But it's in this moment, perhaps, that the light of the world is wanting to shine into your heart and let you know you're not condemned. You're not condemned. But I want to rescue you. I want to shine my light of love, of purpose, of forgiveness, of a new life that leads to life on you today. If you're taking notes, the second insight of Jesus being the light of the world is this. The light pushes back the darkness. So again, look chapter 8, verse 11. Look at what Jesus says. The woman replies first, no one condemns me. Then Jesus says, then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. When Jesus spoke again to the people. So again, can you imagine being in that moment? <laughs> and then he again says to the people after this experience, after seeing that, hey, this gal is not defined by her darkness. She is not defined by this adultery. She's not defined and neither are all of the religious leaders who just left because they've got sin. In two, they're not defined by it, but we can be defined by the light of the world. That he is saying, hey, there, when, when my light invades your life, it begins to push back the darkness if you allow it. And so he will push back the darkness of sexual immorality. He'll push back the darkness of gossip. He's going to push back the darkness of unforgiveness. He's going to push back the darkness of, of just relying on your own strength instead of relying on the strength of the one who rose from the dead. He wants to push back the darkness in our life. Because here's the deal. Following Jesus is so much more than a decision, than a like mental assent to believing that Jesus was who he said he was. Now it starts there, but if we only allow our mind and our heart to stay in, okay, I believe that there's a God. I maybe even believe there's Jesus who died. I maybe he rose from the dead. What is not happening, like, like in the Bible, it says even the demons and Satan believe. And they're obviously not saved, right? So there is a mental action that's happening of they know God, but they do not know God. And I want to encourage all of us today that we would not just make a mental decision, but that we would allow the transformation of the Holy Spirit to change us. As, as followers of Jesus, when we get saved, when we are born again, we are regenerated, we receive a new heart. When we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we are saved and then we begin the journey of becoming more and more like Jesus. He begins to transform us. So where does he transform us? 
everywhere. <laughs> I mean, he begins to transform our attitudes. He begins to transform our actions, our parenting, how we treat our spouse. He begin if we allow the Holy Spirit to give us a new heart, he will begin to push back the darkness in our life. And a year from now, we'll not even recognize the old Lacey because the new Lacey is being regenerated. The new Lacey is becoming more and more like Jesus. And that's what Jesus wants to do in your life. He wants to transform you. You know, what's awesome is that as Jesus transforms us, yes, in our attitude, yes, in our words, yes, in our actions, but also even in our generosity. In October, we did a series called Story. And one of our values at Rock Hills is that we're all about stories, not stuff. And we got to celebrate that, man, through y'all's generosity and God's sovereignty, uh, we were able to purchase these nine acres of hope, uh, that we have a home, and uh, that we're not going anywhere, right? Like, we're going to get to see Jesus changing lives um, for hopefully the next 50 years, right? The next 100 years, that, that we're going to have grandkids here that are finding and following Jesus, and so what was cool was that we encouraged all of us to have a conversation with Jesus and ask Jesus, Jesus, what is the step you want me to take? Not anybody telling me what to do, but Jesus, this is, it's a relationship. And so Jesus, what is my step? What, what do you want me to do? And so one of our dream teamers, they, they shared this story. So uh, she and her husband, they were praying separately about what God wanted them to do. And then they would come together and share, okay, this is what I feel like God's laying on your heart. And that's what Troy and I do in, the, in these moments when we're just asking Jesus, what do you want us to do? And, uh, and it was so cool. So uh, this gal was praying and uh, they had been saving um, to remodel their home, to build, build a room on in their home. And, and uh, she felt like the Lord said this. And I, I, I want to read it because it's just so cool what the Lord said. You are saving to build a room in your house. What if you build a room in my house first? And isn't that just sweet of Jesus? Like he's not saying we'll never remodel. <laughs> he's not saying that that's even bad. He's just saying, would you put my house first and then I'll take care of yours? And I have a feeling because God is a good shepherd and he is a good father that there are going to be things that happen in that family's home and their kids and their grandkids that God's going to do way beyond what they can ask or imagine because they have simply allowed the Lord to transform them. And that's what the Lord wants to do in each and every one of us. The third insight Jesus wants to help us see in Christmas lights is number three, light directs your life. Light directs your life. All right, this is a moment of confession. This is a safe place. Don't be embarrassed. Be comfortable in your own skin. How many of you are afraid of the dark? Ah, I've got, I've got some honest people in here. Okay, me too. I'm totally afraid of the dark. I do not enjoy it. Our kids love playing hide and seek in the dark, like sardines in the dark. Oh, sweet Jesus, I'm praying the whole time. Like, please find me. I don't want to lay here in the dark, like just a couple weeks ago. So we have like a farmhouse table. So it seats eight. And so there's three chairs on, on either side. So, you know, a benefit of being 5'4 is I could lay on top of those three chairs. And if I'm real quiet, then they couldn't find me. So literally Troy walks around the whole table, even looks underneath, but it's dark so he can't see me. But I am just like holding my breath, but I don't like the dark so much. I was like, okay, if they don't find me here pretty soon, I'm going to start like, <coughs> you know, like come find me, sweet Jesus. Um, like I just don't enjoy it. Um, when um, And let, let me tell you, some of you didn't raise your hand because you don't actually know you're afraid of the dark. Here's how you know you're afraid of the dark. If you have a nightlight, if you leave a light on in your hallway or your bathroom door cracked just a tad, or maybe if you're like us, we leave the microwave light on underneath the microwave in the kitchen, that's a nightlight. It's not Dora, it's not Minnie Mouse, but it is a nightlight, okay? So just embrace it, it's gonna be okay. Jesus is gonna help you find freedom. And, um, but, but I am telling you, like I, I really do, when, when I was a little girl, I really struggled with fear. 
when I was about five years old is when it began. And it, man, fear plagued me. And, and I, I needed help. I, I had some counseling. Um, I, I did our freedom groups. Like, like there, there was just until my late 20s, it really had a hold of me. And I loved Jesus. I prayed. I was reading his word. But there was just something that I could not conquer. And, and I just was, I didn't know why. And so I just kind of like, well, Jesus, I know you're with me through it. So even when I struggle, when, when I had kind of those fear battles come up, I would just try to rest in Jesus, talk it through, talk to the counselor, and then it would pass and then I'd move on. But there was a day where I really felt like the Lord said, you've not really asked me to heal you from this. Like I had prayed about it, I had journaled about it, but I had never really just gotten into Jesus. Is this a physical issue? Is this a chemical thing? Or is this an area of my life that I'm just not trusting you? For me, it was because I just wasn't trusting God in some areas where I was afraid. Now, Jesus has totally given me freedom and it does not plague me you can ask Troy it doesn't plague me like it used to I'm so grateful I did our freedom group three times and would do it again and I'm telling you if you've not been in our freedom group yet we're starting new ones in February and uh, if you don't know what small group to be a part of get in one of those and uh, but Jesus is going to help you find freedom um, but something that even when I'm tired or like if I'm really overwhelmed or stressed that instead of sleepwalking um, and sometimes I sleepwalk, poor Troy, pray for him, but I will wake up in the middle of the night and see somebody in our house. <laughs> uh-huh yes yeah not good and so but I don't actually realize it and so when Troy and I first got married you know um I would wake up in the middle of the night Troy Troy somebody's in the house and so he would get up you know and like try to I'm the you know night on the shining armor or whatever and and he would protect me from from myself and uh, <laughs> and so now I mean if somebody breaks in like they're they're, they're just gonna get all of our Hobby Lobby posters because that's about all that our house is full of but um but there's just something in me that I will I, I just kind of struggle with that sometimes when I'm overwhelmed but I tell you those kind of silly stories because what you think you see in the dark you don't actually see when you're in the light Jesus wants you to know that when you're in that dark room and you feel isolated that if you let the light of his light the light of his love to shine in that dark room, that you're not isolated, that there's a family that loves you, that there's a God who died on the cross and rose from the dead so he could have relationship with you. When you feel like you are in a dark room and you feel like your grief is so heavy, there is no way out, Jesus is saying, hey, I am going to give my comfort. I'm going to walk with you through this season. We are going to walk through that darkness into my marvelous light. Whatever darkness you're facing today, Jesus wants you to know what you see in the dark. It actually is totally different once his light is shined on it. Check this out. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Jesus gives light to every area of our life. So the lights are going to come down just for a moment. And I just want us, so this is on purpose, don't worry, and uh, it's not going to stay long. But in the midst of your dark room, Jesus wants you to know today, I'm with you. If you just trust me, put one foot in front of the other. Allow me to invade your darkness Allow me to walk into the, the hurts, the habits, the hang-ups. Allow me to shine my marvelous light of love and grace and truth in your life. In Psalm, a great prayer to pray is search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Friends, we need to pray this prayer. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is a prayer we should be praying consistently. Oh God, would you light up any part of my life that is not falling in line under the grace of your 
of your goodness. Lord, if, there, if there's unforgiveness in me, Lord, help me to forgive. If, if there is, is disunity, oh God, help me to be united. Lord, if there is, is betrayal, if there's been gossip, if there has been any number of things, whatever the things that Jesus may be pulling, shining the light on you today, remember, he's not shining that light to hurt you. He's shining it because he's got so much more for you. He may not give you the next five or 10 years because maybe he's saying, would you just take the first step I've given you? Would you be obedient and get water baptized? Would you be obedient and, 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 and get connected? Don't stay isolated. Well, would you be obedient in what I've called you to? And then, man, I'm, I'm going to start lighting up the, the rest of that path. But if you just stay close to Jesus, stay close to the light, he will not only push back the darkness, invade your darkness, but he will direct your path. So as the lights are coming back on, can we just celebrate the light of the world and that he really did come and he really is good and he really does desire good for each and every one of us. In Matthew 5.16, it says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This is an opportunity we have today to take a next step. So some of you may remember Motel 6 when they had the slogan, we'll leave the light on for you. We'll leave a light on for you. Well, that slogan reminds me of Matthew 5.16. How can we leave a light on for the unconnected in our community. Like as followers of Jesus today, if you're a follower of Jesus, you call Rock Hills home and this will leave a light on for you should be the slogan for each and every one of us. That when I'm on post, when I'm on campus, when I'm in a classroom, when I'm in a boardroom, when I'm in my living room, when I'm at the dentist's office, when I'm at the doctor's office, that wherever I go, I would leave a light on. So how do we do that? How do we live as people of the light? Just simple next steps, practical, that hopefully will give us some handles so that we don't just have information, but we have transformation. So number one, our first step to live as people of the light is to leave a light on in your influence. Leave a light on in your influence. People are watching. What do they see in your life? What do they see when they read your posts or your TikToks or your, your Instagram story? Well, what do people see in, in the words that you're saying and the music you're listening to, the, the movies that you're watching? And don't be legalistic, not at all. But man, it's allowing the light of Jesus to shine on your life and say, oh, Lord, I want to be a light to those around me. Use my influence to help others get a better view of Jesus. Maybe that's your step today. Maybe your step is to lead a light on so that others may see your good works, to leave a light on in your actions, to look for ways to serve, to look for ways to, to serve your spouse, to serve your friends, to serve your kids, to serve your neighborhood, to, to serve those that, that are hurting. You know, serving at Rock Hills or serving at, at church, man, it's really just the floor. It's just where we start because then we go reach the world around us, hopefully Monday through Saturday, and we're serving in those boardrooms and we're serving in, on those construction sites and we're serving in HR and we're serving in our cubicles and we're, we're serving in, in, in whatever area of life we're going. We're serving with our actions. I don't know about you, but when I see those hundreds of gifts in the lobby, I see a light that we get to take care of over 200 foster kids and teenagers that they get a gift this Christmas because there's people like you that took a step to be generous, that took a step to say, hey, I'm gonna leave a light on so that those kids and teens know that no matter what their circumstances are, there is not only people that love them and value them, but there is a God who loves them, who sees them, who has not forgotten them. You know, some, some friends of ours within our church family, uh, Terry and Michael Maybe, and then uh, Paul and Diana Nickel, they're friends of ours, and they're real good buddies. And But Paul and Diana were in our small group, our pickleball small group. We had so much fun. And uh, one of the last groups, uh, Diana and I were talking about how her and Terry had been shopping that day or, or that week. 
and um, that they were shopping to stock or to stuff stockings that Terry and Michael for years have been um, putting together like with socks and non-perishable food and and um, body wash and shampoo. They would put this all to, into a stocking, a Christmas stocking, and then they deliver it to the homeless. Isn't that cool? And so I heard that idea and I was like, oh, what a way <laughs> to help my kids see others and to give value to others. And so, yes, as a church family, we can do so much together, but then individually we can make a difference too. What can you do? Can you buy dinner for somebody? Can you invite somebody that you know is having maybe a loan this Christmas and you can invite them into your home? Uh, maybe it's, it's uh, just giving somebody a call, checking in, but how can we leave a light on with our actions and then leave a light on with your purpose? Whether you're a teacher, you work in construction, you're in a cubicle, you're in leadership, uh, you own a business, you work in a business, you know, right? Like all of the things, our careers are a canvas for our calling. So if we're a stay-at-home dad or a stay-at-home mom, you better believe as you're loving those kids, that as you're shepherding those kids, that you are leaving a light on to point them closer to Jesus. As you are in that office, as you're in that boardroom, as you're on campus, that wherever you're going, that you're saying, okay, my purpose is not just to make money. It's not just to research. It's not just to protect our country. It is to help other people find and follow Jesus. And then another step for some of us today could be to invite the light of the world into your heart. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you are the light of the world. God, would you help each and every one of us in this Christmas season as we see lights to, yes, see the sparkles and, yes, see the fun and the creativity and the light. But, Lord, let us go deeper and let us see that you are the light of the world, that you don't want us to walk in darkness, but you want us to walk with you, that you would light our path. God, for every person wondering, what's my next step? God, would you help us light our path? Help us to know if it's in our influence, if it's in our purpose, if it's in our actions. And Lord, if we have not yet committed our lives to Jesus and invited you to transform us, would you do that now? So as we're just in this moment with our eyes closed, just as an opportunity, just to focus, Jesus is just as real, eyes open or not. <laughs> but when we close our eyes, we just are giving an opportunity to reflect. So for those of you in this moment, that you feel like, man, the light of the world is talking to me, is inviting me into relationship, not to condemn me, to but to restore me. I wanna encourage you, all you have to do is receive the gift of life and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my hurts, my habits, my hangups. I invite you in, make me like you, transform me. I wanna be born again that moving from a decision to follow to a heart transformation, that you can make me more like you. Lord, for all of us in this season, whatever our step is, help us to take it and to give you honor in Jesus' name.